Yeah, well, rapamycin uh, in, in our 2009 paper had a really big effect. Uh, at, we picked a dose um, that seemed like it, it might work, and it did. Uh, it's not the optimal dose, it's less than the optimal dose, but at the dose we chose, both males and females had a significant lifespan extension. To put this into perspective, these drugs are giving like 15 to, at, at the mi middle dose, 15 to 20 percent increase in median lifespan. To, to give a sense of what that means, if you had a cure for cancer in people, no one over the age of 50 ever got cancer again, median lifespan of humans would go up by 3 percent. And the same is true if you had a drug that abolished heart attacks. No one over the age of 50 ever got a heart attack again. Uh, median lifespan for people would go up by less than 3%. That's work done by J. Olshansky and Bruce Carnes and published in Science in 1990. So the drugs that we consider, you know, we have four of these now, that give more than a 10% increase in lifespan in terms of proportional change of healthy lifespan are doing about three times better than some hypothetical drug that abolished cancer in people or abolished heart attacks in people. So there, that's a really significant chunk of additional uh, healthy lifespan. Rapamycin um, in that first paper was also the first drug, I believe, where anyone had showed, we, we found, that it works quite well, even if you start in really old mice. Some of the mice that were exposed in that paper did start until 20 months of age where the median survival is about 24 for males and 26 for females. It took me very much by surprise. We thought only drugs, if a drug was going to slow aging, you really do have to start it when you're young because a lot of aging is what happens between the ages of 20 and 60 or something like that, as everyone knows. So it was stunning that a drug could start as late as that and still have a full lifespan benefit. That really was news scientifically, and I think that's one of the reasons why the editors of Nature were interested in it. But that turns out not to be a fluke. Um, 17 alpha estradiol, which is male specific, works just great if you start it at 16 or 20 months of age in the males. A carbose, which is significant in males and females, though better for males, if you start it in middle age, it still works. It's only about half as good. Starting early is smart for a carbose, but even if you start it, at uh, 16 to 20 months of age, it still works just fine. And um, canagliflozin, our data in, in that group um, haven't been published yet. Um, for males, it's still terrific. For females, as I mentioned, it actually isn't good, but we suspect it's because the, the drug dose, the drug concentrations in the blood of females may be toxic. So we really want to do that again, but with lower concentrations. Of we don't know the answers for any one of those drugs. It wouldn't be too hard to find out. You know, a pharmacologist could look at how quickly it's absorbed, how quickly is it conjugated, how quickly is it excreted, does it go out in the urine, does it go out in the feces, all of that. There's very standard 50-year-old methods for answering that question, and uh, you know, it's I think would be important to address. There's a generic answer, which is really quite firmly established. The enzymes that the liver uses to deal with foreign drugs, these are called enzymes of xenometab xenobiotic metabolism, xenobiotic metabolizing enzymes, are radically different mm. between men and women and between male and female mice. Most of them, not all, but most of them are a lot higher in females, but some are a lot higher in males, and this is also true for people. So the pace at which drugs are conjugated, put into the bile, or put into the urine, or excreted in the feces, or excreted in the urine, very often are sex-specific. Um, it, it's would not, it's not, it doesn't surprise anyone to find that the blood concentrations may be different in men and women, or different between uh, male and female mice. The details on a drug-by-drug -drug basis we haven't looked at yet. The, the one thing I, w I would want to um, add here as a footnote is for acarbose, it has nothing to do with that. Acarbose, nearly all of it stays in the gut. It doesn't get absorbed right. into the body, so excretion is not the key issue. Um, why the acarbose has such a big effect in males and a small, significant, but small effect in females is unknown. It presumably has to do with males being more sensitive to high glucose levels. Acarbose probably works by limiting very high glucose levels, maybe for unknown reasons that triggers something horrible in the males and not so much in females. Most people who suggest a drug think their drug is going to work, but I think the three you've pointed out are the ones that have gotten 
the largest numbers of notices in AARP bulletins and on social media and at uh, the conventions where people uh, want to mingle with uh, snake oil salesmen. So um, uh, they are certainly the most, the most famous. And they, I think there's a different level of enthusiasm for each one of them. Metformin, I think, has been very sensibly proposed as a potential anti-aging drug in people. I, I don't know enough about its benefits and side effects. I know that you yourself have, uh, you know, 10 times more information about this than I do. But a case has been made because it's so very safe uh, in people that it could be used in people to postpone aspects of aging. I can see reasons not to believe that, but at least you can make a case for that. It doesn't seem to work in mice. Um, the ITP showed that it didn't work in mice, and now several other groups have confirmed that result. Rafa de Cabo at one point claimed that it worked in mice, but he used a very weird statistical test, and I suspect that if, you had, if he had used the standard statistical test, it would have failed in his lab as well. I haven't seen the data, so I'm not sure of that, but that's my guess. Resveratrol was, was hyped um, <laughs> for uh, many years. People often with commercial interests or who had a grant or who wanted to get a lot of money for a clinical trial would start their talk with a beautiful bottle of red wine and then say resveratrol is in red wine and sirtuins are uh, uh, important and resveratrol influences sirtuins and just take some of my resveratrol or sirtuin activating agent and you'll live forever. None of that was right. I mean, it's been shown very clearly now that the amount of resveratrol in red wine uh, is, uh, uh, to get enough of it, you need to uh, drink 30 bottles a day. Its status as a sirtuin activator has been questioned by very serious and skilled biochemists. The original data on worms has been disconfirmed by a couple of very good labs. Uh, so it was mostly hype. People made a lot of money by selling companies that had an interest in SIR2 inactivators. We tested it um, because um, the director of the National Aging Institute, Richard Hodes, for the first and last time said, you will test <laughs> resveratrol or you will not get any money this year. We said, yes, sir, yes, sir. So we, we tested it. We used we checked with David Sinclair and asked David, what is the concentration we ought to use? He said, use this concentration and this concentration. We said, sure, we'll do it your way. Let's find out. And it didn't work. And subsequently, many groups now, including groups that Dr. Sinclair is associated with, have shown that it doesn't work to extend lifespan of regular mice. The famous paper was one in which the mice were poisoned with a 60% coconut oil diet. And they weren't dying of aging. They were dying because their liver swelled up to the point that it crushed their lungs and they couldn't inhale. Uh, they couldn't breathe. This is not, I believe, an, a pretty good model for the aging response. So I think the evidence that resveratrol by itself should have been tested was quite weak. And the fact, the evidence that it works is uh, very bad. It, it almost certainly doesn't do anything, at least in mice in terms of uh, uh, aging. It's hard to be cynical. Yeah. People are very easy to fool. <laughs> it's easy to come up with eight or 10 things that people believe because they read them on the internet yeah. or they watch them on Fox News or whatever, and they're just wrong about this, but they're very, people are very, very gullible. The, the anecdote about resveratrol that I think is, um, gives you a sense of what that time was like. I had a, a friend, a neurologist at Michigan, who had been given a huge grant to give resveratrol to Alzheimer's patients or at the early stage to see if it would slow Alzheimer's. Tons of money. And he came around to a meeting of resveratrol biologists, I was attending it, and he asked people what dose to use. And the range of suggested doses as milligrams of drug per person per day uh, ranged over a million fold. <laughs> that is among the the, the experts, the world's experts on resveratrol, the consensus ranged from one to a million as to what dose was the most logical one. So this is a sign of a field that is making it up as it goes along. NR is the last of the three drugs that you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. And it didn't, didn't work. Um, that is, it didn't extend mouse lifespan. Some people said, oh, well, you have to use NMN, a metabolite that would have a more bioavailability and better profiles, and this is reasonable. And um, if someone makes a good case that we should test NMN and we could afford it, the commercial sources are expensive, 
um, we would probably test that as well. I think the notion, I'm not a non-believer. Uh, I am a non-believer for resveratrol. I'm, uh, for NM and the whole nicotinamide modulating family, I think the book is still open and there's a reasonable chance that some really good stuff could come out of that. It might be that you'd have to give an enzyme that modified the metabol, uh, uh, an inhibitor of one of the met metabolizing enzymes or a, a different form. Um, I have a colleague who has suggested, I don't know if this is public yet, but there's someone who suggests that NR may work in combination with another drug. And his ideas are good ones and they've been accepted by the ITP. We're going to try the NR plus something else that this colleague okay. has recommended to us. So although NR by itself did not extend mouse lifespan, uh, it could be that some other trick will uh, lead to physiologically important modulation of NAD availability in some cell of interest. It could be that what counts is changing the availability in a cell in the hypothalamus or in the pancreatic beta cell or in the lymph nodes or something, finding a dose that is appropriately good for the cells that count but doesn't produce side effects in other cells may be tricky, but it might work. I'm, I'd love to test it, other things in that general nature. And of course, I mean, it goes without saying, I, I should have said this earlier, the fact that something fails in mice doesn't mean it's going to fail in people. Testing it in people is going to be much harder. It's easier to sell stuff that's untested. But in principle, one could actually test it in people and see if it does anything good. It could be true that it doesn't work in mice, but it works great in people. <laughs> or it could be that it would work in mice at a 20 times well, higher that uh, yeah. resveratrol has been overhyped. If you look in detail at, at the evidence suggesting it has health benefits, most of those studies are unconvincing, and many of the ones that are convincing were submitted by people who are trying to sell something. The theoretical case that metformin might be good for you, that's plausible. It's un not completely proven, but it's sensible. And the same is true for things that are attempting to rescue age-associated changes in NAD. The, the, I'm no expert in either of those fields, but the little bit I know is consistent with what it's, these sponsors are saying. There's a good plausible case. We get, as I said, you know, in a good year, 20 or 25 applications for eight or 10 of them. There's a good plausible case to be made that this drug deserves testing and most of those good plausible cases yield negative results, and that's expected. That's one of the nice things about aging rate indicators. If, it, if they work, if they are flipped by drugs in a short period of time, then um, we hope our hit rate will, right now it's about 10% give us big effects and a total of 15% give us significant effects. If we can get that up to 50% by pre-screening with aging rate indicators so that half of the drugs we throw into lifespan studies actually give a lifespan benefit, that would be, that would be nice.